Well, uh, this is the Erdish lecture for students. Uh, I, I only see students here, so that's all right. And uh, we have a pretty remarkable lecturer, John Urschel. So uh, let me just say a few words about John. Um, so he did uh, bachelor's and master's at Penn State and at the same time played football. And uh, after the master's degree, he uh, went into the National Football League, played uh, guard for the Baltimore Ravens. So we don't see that many mathematicians on the Baltimore Ravens, but this is a, an exceptional person. And uh, so that was three years. And then the next step was uh, graduate work at MIT with Michelle Gomans, and you'll hear about some of that work today. Um, but it was quite special. So one final step then is that um, he was appointed to an assistant professorship at MIT, and that's very, very unusual to take that step directly from thesis to faculty. So uh, I'm looking forward to John's lecture. And may I just say he's a terrific guy. So, so John, all yours. All right, uh, perfect. First of all, uh, thank you, Gil, for that introduction, and thank you, everyone, for attending. This is the uh, Erdish Lecture for Students. I see a lot of students, I see a lot of non-students. The pace we're going to aim for is very much for the students. For the non-students, I apologize, this is not for you. Uh, <laughs> Gil was, uh, was very kind in his introduction. I, I think I'm not too bad a guy. I do want to say I, I did not immediately jump from PhD to assistant professor at MIT. I had some stops at uh, IAS and Harvard. And uh, though I really enjoyed my PhD and my work with uh, Michelle Gomez, unfortunately you're not going to see any work, any of that work today. There will be no combinatorial optimization. There will be no graphs. There will be no matroids. But what I can promise you is an interesting story, a story that connects, in many ways, classical questions in uh, analysis that were asked in the late 18th century, early, sorry, late 19th century, early 20th century, and the ways in which these questions are actually intimately related to concepts in numerical analysis and numerical linear algebra which are two areas that uh, are very close to my heart and that I actually do research in. And this is really a talk about moments, which if you were in the last lecture here by Anker, he, uh, he talked about, he defined, and he showed the power of these things for solving problems in theoretical machine learning. And eventually, by the end, very briefly, we'll get to the idea of how these things can be useful for matrices. Now that's enough talking, let me start showing you some slides. Uh, the very first quote, or the very first example of these moment problems that I want to show to you is a quote of uh, Chebyshev's. So this goes all the way back to 1874, and Chebyshev, in this paper, The Limiting Values of Integrals, he's solving some theoretical questions, but it's not lost on Chebyshev, the physical interpretation of the questions that he's trying to answer. And he says, okay, this is translated, I believe, but he roughly says he has some material in a straight line, and he knows how long this rod is. He knows how much it weighs. He knows the center of mass, and he knows the moment of inertia of this material, and he wants to understand how well he can estimate the weight of any part of this material. And this, in sort of a, a very physical and applied setting, this is really 
what we call a moment problem. And we'll start by thinking about these moment type questions through the lens of physics and statistics, two things that you know, we often encounter very early on in our, uh, you know, in our undergraduate education. So in physics, which Chebyshev was talking about, what we can imagine is we have some rod here, let's say it's of length L. We have some function M of X, which tells us how much mass is at X and to the left of X. And then we have some density lambda, which is telling us if we look over some small interval of length dx of this rod, how much mass is there in that region? And Chebyshev's question fundamentally is saying, using the weight, the mass center, and the moment of inertia, how can we understand the distribution of the mass on the rod? How can we understand this linear mass density lambda, you know, some non-negative function from zero to L, or how can we understand this mass function, M of X, some monotonically non-decreasing function that's measuring how much mass there is to the left of X. We can also reframe this general type of question that Chebyshev asked in the language of statistics, where here, instead of mass, we're thinking about some random variable, and we're thinking about the probabilities associated to this real valued random variable. We have some cumulative distribution f, which replaces our mass function. It just says, how likely is it that my random variable is at most some value x? And then we have what's called a probability density function, which is a way to represent sort of like the density of the likelihood of our random variable being in any given region. And just like in the physics setting, we can use this information, which here, the integral of a probability density function always integrates to one, so we have this normalization. But then this becomes what was a mass center is an expectation, and what was a moment of inertia is really just a function of expectation and variance. And can we use these things to understand how our probability distribution behaves, what does it look like? What can we say about this thing? So fundamentally, this is the type of question we're going to look at to start. And the big idea that we're really going to lean into today is that given some non-negative weight function, whether it's some probability density function, some linear mass density, these moments, oops, these moments which is just the integral of monomials mu to the k. This k will represent the kth moment. When I take all these things together, maybe some finite amount or infinitely many of them, these will tell me about the thing that's underlying them. They'll tell me about my probability density function. They'll tell me about my you know, cumulative density function, distribution function. And equivalently, we can really think about this Instead of in terms of some non-negative weight function, we can think about this in terms of some non-decreasing distribution function, sigma. So what I have something, what I have is something that's monotonically non-decreasing, it's right continuous, and I get these moments, and this distribution function is related to my weight function and that my weight function is its derivative, if it exists in some so this is the big setup. And to make sure we understand you know, what we're saying here, two concrete examples that maybe you've seen before if you've taken a statistics class or a probability class or maybe you know, some class in theoretical computer science, uh, two really well-known examples of this are Markov's inequality and Chebyshev's inequality in uh, probability. So suppose I have some uh, random variable x Let's suppose it only takes non-negative values, and I choose some value a greater than zero, and I want to know how much mass in, sort of how likely is my random variable to be bigger than a, how much mass in my probability density function is above this point a, 
you can bound this by the expectation of your random variable divided by this value a. Now if you have more information, so here we have one moment, our expectation. If you have more information, let's say you have two moments, this allows you to compute the expectation and the variance. And Chebyshev's inequality tells you that now with two moments, you can really get good estimates on how far away your random variable can be from its expectation, sort of with some probability. Uh, I should mention that uh, Markov, the person on the top, was a student of Chebyshev's. And you know, he's most famous, perhaps, for his study of stochastic processes. The term Markov chains bear his name. You heard his name a lot in the last lecture. And uh, I should also mention that though it's called Markov's inequality, I believe it first appeared in uh, Chebyshev's work. And uh, Chebyshev's inequality here actually just follows from Markov's. So you can uh, get Chebyshev's inequality out immediately by applying Markov's inequality to the random variable x minus its expectation quantity squared. So really the, the inequality on the bottom is the top one in sort of sheep's clothing. Okay. So what does the history of these moment problems look like? Well, I've already told you that Chebyshev is a very early player in this question, as well as uh, his student Markov. Stilches, a Dutch mathematician, also was very involved in the study in the late 1800s. And then in the early 1900s, you have people like Carleman, a Swedish mathematician, and uh, Hamburger and Hausdorff, both German mathematicians who made great contributions to this field. Uh, one thing that I should mention, because I think it's, it's very hard to separate you know, a mathematician's work and their life, I should mention that Hamburger and Hausdorff both sort of uh, were in Germany, and uh, Hamburger left Germany in 1939, right at the start of World War II. Hausdorff attempted to leave in 1939. He uh, attempted to emigrate to the United States. He wrote a note to Courant, but was uh, unsuccessful, and the end of Hausdorff's life is actually quite sad. But this, the details of that story is for a different talk. Our main goals, well, their main goals, and sort of one of our main goals today is to understand the classical moment problem. So what we want to do is we're going to take in some sequence of moments parameterized by the uh, non-negative integers, 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. And what we want to ask is does there actually exist some distribution that achieves these moments? So you give me a sequence of numbers and you ask me whether or not I can actually give you some distribution back that actually achieves those moments. So this is the classical moment problem that these people were really fascinated with when they were studying these things in the late 1800s, early 1900s. And this has been studied under various settings. So when your interval is uh, bounded, as you can just say without loss of generality, the interval zero one, this was uh, studied by Hausdorff, it bears his name. When you're looking at the entire real line, this is called the hamburger moment problem. And when you're looking at uh, half of the real line, this is called the Stilchitz moment problem. And the other question that they were really focused on sort of early on were concentration inequalities. So given some amount of moments, try to bound what the uh, concentration of sort of mass looks like and trying to get sort of tight bounds on how much this distribution can change based on some fixed number of moments. And we today are very much going to focus on the classical moment problem. And in particular, we're going to focus on this setting of hamburger where we have some moment problem on the real line. And we're going to get to what is a very, a very good sketch of a proof of when you can do this. And the idea is that this sketch along the way is going to introduce us to some really powerful tools in numerical analysis and numerical linear algebra. So that's the, the setup so far. 
before we start going any further, how do we feel about the setup? So especially undergrads, do we have any questions? Is anything feel vague? Does anything feel a little uncertain about where we're going with this? Questions are reasonable, I want to stress. Okay, yeah. Back here. No. Just pretended that I heard you. Okay, so the big theorem here, this is Hamburger's theorem, is that you give me some sequence of moments from zero, one, two, three, four, five, all the way to infinity, and I can give you a distribution back that achieves those moments that increases infinitely many times, if and only if my set of moments is what we're going to call a positive sequence. And I'm going to say that the set of moments is a positive sequence if this associated quadratic form is always positive for x's that are not all identically zero for every single k. And this can be equivalently formulated as saying that the determinant of a Hankel matrix formed using these moments is always strictly positive for every k. So this is our main theorem, and this is what we're going to spend most of the time today thinking about, reasoning about, and more or less roughly proving that this is true. Now, at this point, I wanna stress, it's probably not immediately obvious why this condition is popping up. The way that I've written it here is not exactly, you know, it's not exactly showing, you know, some great insight into why sh we should need this. The way in which the necessity starts to sort of become very straightforward is when you understand that this quadratic form is actually encoding the integral of something with respect to our distribution. So the reason why we really need this is because this quadratic form is actually encoding the integral of the square of some polynomial, a polynomial whose coefficients are encoded by these parameters x of i. And so why do we need this quadratic form to always be positive for any x that's not identically zero? Well, you know, if we have some distribution function that's increasing infinitely many times, well, first of all, we know that the integral of something that's non-negative had better be non-negative, otherwise we have problems. So we know that this definitely needs to be greater than or equal to zero. But the strict positivity comes from the fact that if we fix k, what we're doing is we're integrating the square of a polynomial of degree k. How many zeros can a polynomial of degree k that's not the zero polynomial have? For students. No. K, so we can have, yeah, okay, the answer is also on the board, but I'm trying to give easy questions to start. We'll, we'll get to some more difficult things. So the point is that this has at most k zeros and my distribution, we assumed, increased infinitely many times. So that means this has to increase somewhere where my polynomial is not zero, and therefore this integral has to be positive. So this is really getting to the heart of why we need this condition, because otherwise things just don't make sense. The real heart of this proof is trying to actually construct some distribution given these moments, and there are a lot of different ways to sort of show this or to go about this. The way in which I want to show this is going through one of the most fundamental sort of concepts in numerical analysis. Okay, the idea for our construction is what we're going to do is we have all these moments. We don't, I don't wanna see them all. This is too many, infinitely many, this is too many. I can't handle it. I just wanna see finitely many of them. In fact, I just want the first two times k of them. And what I want to do is for any fixed 
2 times k of them. I want to build some distribution that achieves these moments, and I want this distribution to increase at most k many times. And my idea is, if I can do this for every single k, then I claim that something good is happening. The idea is that if for each of these I have some monotonic step function that's increasing at most k times, then I get a sequence of uniformly bounded monotone functions. And uh, the nice thing is that Helly's theorem tells us that uh, if we have this sequence, we're going to get a convergent subsequence. And this will give me my distribution. Okay, so I'm reducing this problem of coming up with some distribution function given all my moments to solving this problem just given two times k moments and trying to construct something that increases only at at most k points and I get to choose how much it increases by. So really what I'm asking is I'm asking, can I solve some nonlinear system of equations? I have two times k moments, so j varies from zero to two times k minus one, and I have two times k parameters to work with. I have the k places where my distribution is going to increase, the k places where you know, I'm really putting mass, and then I get to decide at these k points, how much mass am I placing at each point? And this is nonlinear because, okay, if you notice the alpha i's, if we fix our x's, this becomes linear in alpha, but because we have these x's to this power, this is not linear in x. So, you know, a priori, if we just look at this, it might not be immediately obvious. Are we getting a solution out? Is the solution unique? How are we going to solve this problem? It's not so obvious. But the thing that I'm going to claim is that if we could solve this problem, if we can solve this problem, we're actually doing something much better than just proving some construction for Hamburger's theorem. So let's take a step back and think about what we're actually saying here. So suppose we actually have some distribution Okay, we have moments, so if we're integrating polynomials, we can essentially say that the integral of some polynomial is parameterized by its moments, and I'm going to abuse notation by just saying this is the integral with respect to sigma x, in the sense that I know what this should be if it exists. The idea is that suppose I actually want to compute some integral. I want to integrate some polynomial, let's say of degree at most 2k minus one, and I want to integrate this with respect to this distribution function, what I'm actually proposing here is that I can evaluate this integral exactly, simply by evaluating my polynomial at k places and weighting this sum by these k parameters, alpha of i, where alpha varies, alpha i varies from one to k. So what I'm actually building for you here is something pretty powerful. I'm giving you a tool that allows you to integrate polynomials up to some size just by evaluating your polynomial and taking sums of this. So I'm converting something that you know, feels very continuous into something that's discrete. So I'm really what I'm doing here and what we're going to spend the next big chunk of this talk talking about is the idea of how do we actually build what is a numerical integration procedure? I have something I want to integrate, and I'm going to do so by evaluating something at finitely many points. And this technique is called Gaussian quadrature. The idea is that if I have some formula that allows me to integrate all polynomials up to the degree 2k minus one, which if the moments of these things match, then that means that these two things are exactly equivalent. This tells me that suppose I don't want to integrate a polynomial because sometimes we have to integrate things that aren't 
you know, so nice as polynomials, I want to integrate some function. It's not a polynomial, but the big takeaway here is that if I have some rule that allows me to integrate polynomials up to some degree exactly, then this is actually going to allow me to approximately integrate any function f, where here I say, for sufficiently smooth functions, and note that strong hand waving is occurring here, but uh, the idea is that if I have some function, and this function can be well approximated by a polynomial that equals this function at the point that I'm evaluating my polynomial at, as long as that polynomial and this function don't vary too much at places that are not those points, then these integrals, this integral and this sum, are going to be almost exactly equal. And if you want a rigorous uh, bound on how close these two quantities are, how this depends on f, this appears in, a, in any standard undergraduate numerical analysis class. So this past fall at MIT, I taught uh, math 18.330, so that's our undergrad numerical analysis class. This was covered and at your local institution, if you have an undergrad numerical analysis class, I'm going to punt the actual rigorous error estimates for this and the proof of this to your favorite numerical analysis uh, instructor or professor at your university. But the point is that there's a really rigorous way in which closeness can be defined here. Okay, so now the question is, we have this nonlinear system of equations, how are we going to solve this? How are we going to build this integration rule that is both a practical technique to allow you to integrate things that you encounter in the wild, but also a tool to construct this distribution for Hamburger's theorem. And the idea is that we can really think about this problem through linear algebra. So the system of equations I'm trying to solve, this is really some property of polynomials of some degree. And what I claim is that if you think about all the polynomials, let's say of some fixed degree, or even just all polynomials in general, these actually form a vector space. Let's think about this for a second. You take two polynomials, you add them together, you still get a polynomial. You scale a polynomial by some number, you're still getting a polynomial. What we have here is a vector space. And Okay, when you have vector spaces, one nice thing that you might want to do, I mean, you know, when you take linear algebra, at MIT this is 1806, or Anker's new 18C06, if you have a vector space and you can endow it with what's called a inner product, or you know, sometimes a dot product in Rn, this allows you to do some really nice things and some really powerful stuff. And here, for polynomials, we can actually do this. And the way I want to define an inner product here is I want to define the inner product between two polynomials, P and Q, as the integral of their product with respect to this distribution, sigma of x. Now, of course, you might say, well, aren't we trying to build this thing? You're using this in the definition. Note that I'm using this as shorthand in that what this integral should be, if it exists, is fully parameterized by the moments I'm given. So really, when I define this inner product, I'm defining it as a function of my moments, but you should think that, okay, at the end, we are getting some distribution function out, and this is really the integral of their product. So far, so good. And why is this actually an inner product? Well, you can check all the properties. The key one that we really need to take a look at is the fact that these moments form a positive sequence this tells us that we get positive definiteness of this inner product. And this is the sort of the key one of all properties to check. Okay, so now, so far so good. We're doing pretty well. We have a vector space. I just defined an inner product. And now, okay, the sort of name of the slide is orthogonal polynomials, so you can probably guess where I'm going with this. I have a vector space, I have some inner product. 
let's start thinking about a basis, right? It's always good to have some sort of basis to work with, and you might say, okay, I want a basis for polynomials. A natural thing you could do is you could say, well, why don't I just use all the monomials? You know, I'll take one, I'll take x, I'll take x squared, x cubed. This is definitely a basis. These things are linearly independent. But oftentimes, when you want to take, you know, some problem in linear algebra and make it simpler, a good way to do this is to take an orthogonal basis. This often is sort of the right way to represent things. And just like when in linear algebra you want to take some orthogonal basis built from a basis you already have, doing Gram-Schmidt orthogonalization, we can actually do the same thing here with these polynomials. And this is going to produce what we call orthogonal polynomials. So what I can do is I can build some orthogonal basis of polynomials, P0, P1, all the way to PK, where each polynomial is monic, so that means its leading term has coefficient one, and the ith polynomial is of degree i. And how can I do this? Well, the natural way you can think about this is I take this sort of natural basis for polynomials that we just talked about, one x, x squared, all the way to x to the k, and I can just perform Gram-Schmidt orthogonalization that you learn in, in linear algebra class. I understand, you know, we don't have, you know, vectors in Rn here, we have polynomials, but I claim that I have a vector space, I have an inner product, and now everything is really the same. And this will allow me to build this basis. Now you can build this basis in a slightly slicker way by proving that uh, if you want to do Gram-Schmidt to this sequence, that actually you don't need to orthogonalize to all your previous vectors, you only need to orthogonalize to your previous two. But this takes a little bit of work to see and is not the most obvious thing. Uh, verification of its non-obviousness. I, uh, so I should mention, I've given this talk twice before, uh, once at uh, the Harvard undergrad colloquium and once for uh, MIT undergrads as part of a summer program. And when I gave this talk at Harvard, I very quickly learned that this, uh, this question of three-term recurrence actually was a qualifying exam question for uh, the Harvard analysis qual. So I, I don't know what year it was. Noam Elkies mentioned this to me. Maybe 2020, maybe 21. But I should mention that uh, you know, these things do show up. This showed up on a Harvard analysis qual. So I hope you will allow me to skip the, the details of this. OK, good. Okay, but the key thing that I want you to note about these polynomials I've built, they have a really, really interesting property. So if I look at, let's say, polynomial pi, it's orthogonal to p0, p1, p2, all the way up to pi minus 2. Because these polynomials were built by applying Gram-Schmidt to this sequence, I know that the first, let's say, i of these span the same subspace as the first i of these. That means that pi is not just orthogonal to p0, p1, all the way to pi minus 1. pi is also orthogonal to 1, x, x squared, all the way to x to the power i minus i. And that tells me that this polynomial pi is actually orthogonal to all polynomials of degree at most i minus 1 because I just gave you a basis for them. Okay? And this is the key property that really makes things go here. All right, now we're almost ready to really sort of bring this all together and give you a big takeaway about how these orthogonal polynomials are actually intimately related to this Gaussian quadrature question that I asked you. This question of solving this nonlinear system of equations has a really, really elegant answer, actually. 
surprisingly simple. The big claim, and this is sort of the biggest claim of the whole talk that we're gonna sit with for a little bit, is that when I want to solve this nonlinear system, when I wanna figure out which points I should evaluate my polynomial at, and I wanna figure out how much I want to weight each of these function evaluations, the right answer is actually to take these points to be the roots of my kth degree orthogonal polynomial. And once I fix the roots, then I can solve for my alpha i's just by solving a linear system. And the linear system that they should solve, it looks a little wonky, but the idea is that when j does not equal zero, this thing should be zero. It says that if I want to integrate some polynomial, oops, what if I want to integrate some polynomial pj, where j is greater than one, this weighted sum had better be zero because the integral of it needs to be zero. Why? Because if I want to integrate some polynomial pj, that's the same as integrating the polynomial pj times the number one. And one is my very first element of my basin. Because, well, when you perform Gram-Schmidt, I start with this first element, one, and I do nothing to it. So any of these polynomials times one, if I integrate it, this needs to give me zero. And so this equation here is just saying each polynomial for j greater than one, j greater than zero, if I do this weighted sum, it needs to match the integral, and the integral is zero. So this weighted sum needs to be zero, except when j equals zero. And then this should just exactly equal the integral of this piece here. Okay. This is a big claim. It's not immediately obvious why this should be true. But what we're going to do is spend a couple minutes thinking about why we should believe this. So what do we need to show? What do we really need to check before we start buying that like what I'm saying here is true? Okay. So there's a bunch of things we have to check. First of all, I'm telling you these things are roots of some polynomial. Why should these roots even be real? Why should they be distinct? We need to prove this, we shouldn't just believe this. Why should I believe that these weights that are the solution to some linear system, why should I even believe that these things are well-defined? How do I even know that this system is giving me a solution out? Another thing is that uh, a nice property that we really need is these weights had better be positive because I claim this distribution, well, needs to be some monotonic, non-decreasing thing. If one of these alpha i's turns out to be negative, I'm kind of in some trouble. So we need to show that. And then the last thing we need to show is that I've actually built something that matches these moments. What I want to do is I want to start by showing that these roots are real and distinct, and then we'll, we'll see how much time we have. Usually I don't show all these properties, but I like to show a couple. I like to show one and then maybe viewer's choice. We'll see what people want to see. So first, let's actually make sure that these roots are real and distinct. The idea is a fairly standard trick that you see a lot in numerical analysis. And it's a typical proof by contradiction. The idea here is, let me look at this polynomial PK. I'm going to look at all of its roots. If it doesn't have K real distinct roots, then what I know is that I'm going to have some roots of odd multiplicity all the way up to L, and this L is going to be less than K. If I have you know, some complex roots, they're always going to come in pairs. This is some real valued function with real coefficients. And what I can do is if I don't really have K roots, what I'm going to do is I'm just going to build some new polynomial that has a single root at all of the roots of PK that had odd multiplicity. So now I've built some polynomials QL, and 
oh, you'll have to excuse me, this k has now gotten small when that was big, forgive me. But the key thing to keep in mind is now all of a sudden, when I multiply this q of k by p of k, all of a sudden I've built some polynomial that's not changing sign on the real line. Because every single time this pk of x has odd multiplicity, I have now converted it to even multiplicity using my q of x. Okay, well if this thing doesn't change sign, then I know that the inner product of q of x and pk of x with respect to sigma, which is really with respect to these moments, I know that this thing does not equal zero. And if this thing does not equal zero, well, all of a sudden, this is telling me that L has to equal K. Why? The answer is not on the, on the screen this time. For an undergrad, this integral is not zero. Why does this tell me L has to equal K? Yeah. Exactly. So because we know pk of x is orthogonal to all polynomials of degree less than k, and we know that uh, y1 to yl, l can be at most k, because pk has at most k real distinct roots, we know that l has to be exactly k. So we get that the roots are distinct and they are all real. Good, good job. Okay. Next, let's briefly look at why we should believe that these weights are actually well-defined. Why are we actually getting some solution out? Well, this really turns into, again, a linear algebra problem. We have some linear system, and we need to make sure that we're actually getting a solution out. What we really need to do is we can prove something stronger. We can take the sequence of polynomials, P0, P1, all the way up to PK minus 1, that appears in this linear system, and we just need to prove that this matrix associated with our linear system is non-singular when we're evaluating our polynomial at distinct points. So we're gonna prove this for any points ti that are distinct, when really we only need this for x1 to xk. What we're going to do is we're going to do a proof by contradiction. If this matrix A is singular, then we know that there's some vector y that's not the zero vector, such that y transpose a equals zero. And what we can do is we can use these y's to build a polynomial. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to define this q of x to equal a weighted sum of my orthogonal polynomials up to degree k minus one, weighted by the coefficients of this y. And now, the fact that y transpose a equals zero is actually encoding the fact that this t1 all the way to tk, that these are all zeros of this polynomial q of x that I've built. But I have a problem. q of x is of degree at most k minus one. It's the weighted sum of polynomials of degree at most k minus one but it has k roots. This tells me that this q of x has to be the zero polynomial. And if it's the zero polynomial, this tells me that my y was actually identically zero. Okay. All right, that the moments match take a little bit more work than I'd like to show. I'm going to punt to your local numerical analysis class for the sake of time, so we're just gonna Skip that one. And uh, we will finish off just by showing that these weights are actually indeed positive. And the way we're going to do this is again, all of these proofs have a similar flavor, a similar type of trick, and this one is no exception. The way we're going to show that these weights are positive is what we're going to do is if I want to show that alpha i is positive, I'm going to build this polynomial or rather, if I want to show alpha j is positive, I'm going to build this polynomial q of j where it has a root 
of multiplicity two at every single point xi for i not equal to j. So this thing has degree two times k minus two. And the thing you'll notice is its integral is positive. Why? Because if you look at this integral, it's the sum of alpha i's times my qj evaluated at all these different points. Note that the degree is 2k minus 2. This is less than 2k minus 1. I can integrate this thing exactly. So my weighted sum is exactly going to match my integral. Now this weighted sum, if I put in any xi that is not equal to j, this is going to equal 0. And I'm left with a single term, the term evaluated at xj. I get alpha j times some quantity that's a product of squares. And this is telling me that my alpha j is greater than zero. Okay. All right, so this completes what was essentially a sketch. I didn't show you every small detail, but gets you to the heart of the type of techniques that are used to prove these results in Gaussian quadrature. What I want to do from here, I've got uh, about five minutes left, give or take a little bit of time, is now we're finally getting to the last part of this talk. Yes, we've seen some matrices, but I haven't really told you how do these things connect to questions that I care about. Okay, I care about Gaussian quadrature, so let's, I don't want to act as if what I've talked about doesn't matter. It's you know, a very, very powerful technique in numerical analysis. But I want to get to numerical linear algebra and show you that the things I've been talking about today are actually connected to what are cutting edge questions in numerical linear algebra. So now we're finally going to go from these moment questions to matrices. So suppose I have some Hermitian matrix A if you take A to be a real matrix, we can just call it symmetric. And what I want to know is how am I going to approximately compute its eigenvalues really quickly? Let's suppose I want to do this quickly in the sense that, uh, you know, doing the QR algorithm, this is way too slow. Spectral bisection is way too slow. I don't want to look at things that are matrix multiplication time or n cubed but I want to look at things that can give me approximate answers really, really quickly. In particular, if my matrix A is sparse, if it doesn't have a lot of entries, I can apply it very quickly. I want to do something that gives me a good approximation of these eigenvalues without having to fully factor my matrix A. And so a very natural thing I can do is I can convert this eigenvalue problem for my matrix into the problem we've essentially been studying for the past you know, 40 odd minutes, I can define a distribution that just increases at every single eigenvalue of A. And it increases by a unit amount, you know, scaled with multiplicity. And what I can do is I can do what we've been doing. I estimate this distribution by building some distribution that increases at most k times by some amount by looking at the first two times k moments of what's often called the spectral distribution of my matrix A. And what you'll notice is that these moments actually correspond to sums of powers of my eigenvalues. So the first question is, how are we going to get these moments? So does anyone, you know, any undergrad in the audience know a good way to get the uh, sum of uh, all the eigenvalues of a matrix to the power i? Yeah, so raise your hand who said it. Okay, so someone said we can take the trace. And so indeed, one of the uh, sort of best ways to do this, I mean, probably the most straightforward, is what we can do is we can compute these moments by taking the trace of powers of my matrix. These are going to give me these sums of eigenvalues. But the problem here is if we wanted to do this exactly, this is already getting kind of expensive because I'm taking powers of my matrix. I'm doing things I didn't really want to do. 
And so the question of how do we actually do this in practice is we settle for something that's not exactly the moments, but we're going to get some estimator for them. So this is relating to you know, what actually happens in practice often. Okay, Anker talked about this in his last talk. You don't get the moments exactly. You get them approximately. You build something from that, and then you can argue that what you've built is really close to the thing you care about. And here, the way we can build things in a really intelligent way, our second idea is rather than taking powers of our matrix A, a really smart way to do this is why don't we build some random vector B? So I choose some random vector, and instead of taking powers of my matrix, I look at powers of my matrix applied to this vector B, and I take a Rayleigh quotient. And the idea here is that I'm not exactly getting my moments out, but in fact what I'm getting is moments that are slightly off and moments of a slightly different distribution. So now instead of the sum of lambda to the i, what I'm getting is a sum of lambda to the i weighted by some quantity alpha of lambda squared that represents the uh, decomposition of B in its eigenbasis. But because B is random, what we should view, you know, if B is uniform on the hypersphere, the expected squared value of this inner product should be about one over N. And so the idea is that our moments should be approximately these Rayleigh quotients that we're getting from our matrix, where these moments are actually exactly the moments of this slightly perturbed distribution. You can show that this distribution and the original spectral distribution of our matrix are actually quite, quite close up to, let's say, one over root n in a, like Wasserstein distance or L1 norm, if that means something to you. So really, we're getting an approximation that is very, very good when the number of moments we're using is much smaller than root n because the difference between this distribution and the distribution we care about for a typical random B are essentially the same at the scale that we care about, okay? And this sort of fundamental idea of using low order moments of some random approximation of the thing we actually care about, this is sort of based on a more general type of ideas in numerical linear algebra called Krilov subspace methods. So the idea more generally that shows up in so many different areas of numerical linear algebra is as follows. I want to solve some numerical linear algebra problem. Maybe I want to solve AX equals B or AX equals lambda X. But what I want to do is solve it approximately for low degree polynomials. So I want to approximately solve this by restricting to the span of some vector B and the application of polynomials in A of degree at most, let's say R minus one, applied to that vector B. And some examples that maybe you've heard of, maybe you haven't, if you have some symmetric positive definite linear system, conjugate gradient is a very famous and well-known technique. The uh, technique for this Hermitian eigenvalue problem that I sketched for you is this Lanchos method, and more generally, this technique applied to other settings has different names, different issues and different properties. And uh, if you look at you know, modern numerical linear algebra conferences, modern, you know, like what people are writing papers on, this subject, broadly speaking, is really on the cutting edge of what people in numerical linear algebra care about. Right, so just to summarize, we started with a very old problem in analysis from the late 1800s, early 1900s. We solved a special case of this problem through Gaussian quadrature, really a modern numerical technique to perform numerical integration. And by the end, we've seen that this technique we've built is really more general than integrals and analysis, but really a powerful technique to solve problems in numerical linear algebra. So uh, I'll stop here, it's uh, 7.54, and with that, uh, I think I'll end the talk.
you very much. Thank you very much, John. I'm going to go home and write orthogonality is important a hundred times uh, to, to remember the, an essential point here. And, and as, as you know, uh, every matrix has singular vectors that are orthogonal and that are super important. So that was an outstanding lecture. Are there questions? Questions or discussion? Questions or discussion or? Uh, what do you think? Yes. So I'm not an undergrad, I'm an educator. I work with students in the K-12 world. I was very impressed with your pedagogy. I took a lot of notes on the way you phrase things. And one thing that really struck me was when you said, this is computationally expensive. You said, this is getting really expensive. So I was wondering if you ever talked to students who are undergrads or at any level on that idea of computational price or expect expensivity and how you coach students to make decisions on their methods when that comes up. Yeah, absolutely. That's something that I found when I was an undergrad. I did not understand very well. You know, when I was an undergrad, I took, you know, courses in numerical analysis, some grad classes in numerical linear algebra, numerical PDEs, but I really didn't understand for a very long time, what does computationally expensive really mean? And when I, you know, when I taught uh, numerical analysis this fall and when I have students, the way I like to really illustrate this is you have some problem you want to solve. At what point do you start to reach a bottleneck where you can't solve this problem, where it doesn't actually work so well? And one of the sort of easiest examples that I like a lot is you pull up uh, Julia or Python or MATLAB, you know, your favorite program, and maybe you just want to solve AX equals B. So you just generate some random dense A and you just do uh, some, you know, some random B and just do A backslash B using, you know, laypack. How big does A get before things start get, getting really slow? And looking at that compared to, let's say, using uh, techniques that run in linear time to see what does cubic scaling really look like compared to linear? When you say, okay, I do it 100 by 100, this happens in a, the blink of an eye. I do 1,000 by 1,000, it takes a second, but it happens. I do 10,000 by 10,000, and now all of a sudden, I'm really waiting. And 100,000 by 100,000, this is, this is going to take a very long time. You had better like, you know, go, on, go on vacation, depending on your computer laptop. And so understanding what that means in terms of practical size is usually, I find, more helpful than just fully focusing on asymptotics, but understanding how do those asymptotics actually behave when you want to put something on a computer. At least this is the sense from a numerical analysis, numerical linear algebra point of view. Of course, there's the other point of view that understanding what's computationally expensive and asymptotic behavior, which hopefully often gives insight to the right algorithms when you hit the right asymptotic sort of like threshold. So do you tell students whenever things are starting to feel computationally expensive that maybe that's a sign that they should change their approach or look for an algorithm? Yes, so that's the sign that you should look for a different approach or understand that maybe the problem you're trying to solve actually is reaching its bottleneck in terms of the best algorithms we can come up with and how quickly we can actually hope to solve this problem right now in 2024 on a modern computer. Because there really are thresholds that you're going to hit, and depending on the problem, depending on you know, what's involved, these things can actually hit quite quickly or quite slowly depending on you know, the actual problem you're trying to solve and what you can hope for in terms of the algorithmic lower bounds. Thank you, that's very helpful. Yeah, absolutely. Are there other questions? Uh, maybe uh, the rest of the questions we take offline, so we're getting to the end of the time. I don't know if there's a speaker after me, but I will be 
in room 204 for 20 minutes after this? And I think. Um, so, uh, I do want to give oh. John his uh, certificate, so maybe we can all thank him again. For <laughs>